I'm going to talk to you about uh, certificates of analysis. Um, you can get hold of these with your malt. They should arrive with your malt, uh, certainly if you're getting it directly from Crisp. And also, we have a QR code on the bag. And if you scan that with the Crisp malt app, then you can get the uh, analysis for that particular batch up on your phone screen. So that's a little picture of the QR code there on the bag. And as long as you're connected to the internet, then you will be able to read that and it will bring up the analysis for that particular batch. We also have typical parameter values uh, for all our malts on the website at chrismalt.com. So those are two ways that you can look at these in detail for each of the malts that you have from us. So I want to now talk about different parameters. Um, I've not done them all. I've done the ones that I think are important. Certainly to me as a brewer, when I were brewing, um, I've been with Chris five years now. And prior to that, I've been in the industry since 1989. I worked in many different breweries. So let's talk about moisture first of all. Um, we actually take five grams of milled malt and we dry that for three hours at 105 degrees and then measure the weight loss and that's the percentage moisture that we quote on the COA. The moisture content is related to malt type um, because the lighter the malt in colour then the higher the moisture will be. So sometimes if you want a particularly pale malt you might have to compromise a little on that because if we increase the temperature to get a higher coloured malt an ale malt or maybe a Vienna or a Munich, then the moisture will come down. And it's the opposite if you wanted extra pale or a lager malt. Um, so that's part of the uh, process of, of making the malt and the kilning process. A lot of the results you'll see on a COA, a certificate of analysis, are reported on a dry basis. And I want to talk about that next. Okay. So let's talk about extract. Extracts, what you're buying. At the end of the day, this is going to give you the sugar from the brewing process that you can put with the yeast tank, create some alcohol and make some lovely flavours. So we get that from wort. Uh, what we do is we mill uh, a sample of malt, a, a, a particular weight of malt, on a, on a disc mill. Uh, that's a picture of it there. So it goes in the little brown funnel at the top. And it actually comes out, you can't quite see in the picture, but it comes out of the front and then we collect that. And then we would mash that in. So for Institute of Brewing Analysis malts, the gap is set at 0.7 millimetres. And for European Brewing Convention and ASBC malts, the gap is set at 0.2. Now, there is another method that we can use depending on which uh, analytical um, data we're using. Uh, that is a, a finer grind and we can compare those. It's not something that we do particularly often, um, but uh, if you do see a force, fine coarse difference, then the greater that difference is, the less well modifying the malt. It, it should be a low number. So if you do see that on analysis, then that's what it, it's there. It's there to give us an indication of the degree of modification of the malt. So once we've milled the malt, we put it in one of the little jars. So there's 25 uh, little pots that go in there. Each one of those is a mash, and that's kept at a constant temperature. And that temperature is defined by the type of analysis we're going to do. So that's the mash bath. Um, in actual fact, when we mash it, it's, it's much thinner than a mash than, than someone would use in a brewery. And one of the reasons for that is we don't sparge it. We don't have the opportunity to see from the piece of equipment. So uh, we need to make it liquid enough to do the extraction and to give us a representative sample at the end of the day. But there are actually two methods. I'll cover that on the next slide in terms of uh, how we actually do the mash. But one is for Institute of Brewing. And if we're doing EBC or ASBC analysis, then we'll use a different mashing profile. I'll show you that in a moment. Once we've done the mash, we will separate the work through a filter paper and then we'll do a gravity on the work and we'll do that on a densitometer using Anton Parr densitometer. And that's how we calculate the extract. So the Institute of Brewing is expressed in litre degrees per kilogram. And EBC and ASBC is expect, expressed as a percentage, percentage extract. So there's the two different mashing profiles. So 
The top pink line, um, as you can see, is isothermal. So that's at 65 degrees C and it lasts 60 minutes, which is pretty much a standard mash for a mash tun, isothermal mash tun profile. Uh, and that's particularly suited to UK malts because they're well modified and they don't need additional temperatures to activate the enzymes and start to get the extract out. If you look at the red line, what we do there is we start the mash at 45 degrees C and at that level we're going to get some beta-glucanase activity and beta-glucanases break down cell wall material. We then ramp it up over about 25 minutes and that goes up through the proteolytic enzyme activity around 53 degrees C and that helps break down some of the protein. Again, helping modify uh, and, and get to the extract. And then we finish off and we do um, the rest at 70 degrees and that goes through the beta and alpha amylase, which is gonna get the extract out the malt and then we can measure that. So those are the two methods that we use depending on which type of analysis we're gonna quote. So let's talk about how we interpret these numbers. Um, one thing to note is that every batch of malt will be slightly different. And you need to adjust the amount of malt accordingly um, using what's called the as-is extract. So if the certificate of analysis doesn't show an as-is extract, it shows a dry extract, and you can see on the formula there that you can easily calculate it. And essentially what you're doing is you're deducting the moisture content from the malt to give you a true potential value of extract. If that's moving up and down, it should move up and down a great deal. You will need to adjust the quantity of malt to make a particular number of litres of wort at a particular strength. One thing to know is that the lab extract, because it's milled so fine and it's mashed in a different way to which you were doing it in a brewery, it's unlikely that you'd ever achieve that level of extract in the brewery. Now, if you are fortunate enough to have a hammer mill, and a mash filter, then you can actually achieve better than we do in the lab. Um, but uh, mostly on the, on the craft brewing scale, that, that's not possible. One thing we do for our customers that take pre-crushed malt uh, is we check the extract on that crush. So we'll do a mash in the mash bath at 65 degrees with that particular crush of malt. And that then gives us an idea of the extract consistency. Uh, we check the gaps and we check the, the particle distribution of the, of the uh, crush malt every day anyway. But we do this once a week across the different malts to make sure that we're getting the extract we want. Um, and we'll be talking about that on our next webinar. One thing to keep in mind when you are constructing recipes uh, is to factor in brew house efficiency. Um, I do have a spreadsheet that I can share with people um, if you would like it and that allows you to change the factors and change the strengths of the malts, the, um, iso iso the alpha acids on the hops and it will then correct the recipe to the actual ingredients that you're going to use for that particular brew and it can be changed up and down usually between 80 and 98 percent depending on your system for the brew house efficiency and it will add more malt to compensate for that and give you the yield that you're looking for. Okay. So let's move on to colour. Uh, this is a really important parameter for our consumers, for the people who enjoy beer. And I want to talk a little more about that. So we take the work that we made in the mash bath that we've filtered and we measure it visually by comparing the colour to standard colour discs. So that's the instrument there. It's called a Lovey Bond comparator. And basically you take a sample in a standard sized cell and put it into the machine and then on the left and right hand side are two discs and within those discs are different standard colors and you turn the discs around until you get a match with the sample itself and that's the color that you record. Now some uh, brewery labs, particularly in the bigger labs that I've worked in, uh, will sometimes measure color on a spectrophotometer at 430 nanometers that's in the yellow part of the coloured spectrum. And so it's not always that accurate when you get to brown beers and, and darker beers. 
And that's one thing to know in actual fact, because when we're doing worts on our speciality malts, such as crystal malt, chocolate, black, those kind of things, those are too dark to be able to compare with the colored discs. And so what we do is do a careful serial dilution, and then we measure them at that, and then multiply it back up. And this is one of the reasons why the tolerance on darker malts is wider, because that dilution introduces a little bit of uh, error in terms of measuring the color, uh, albeit we do that as accurately as we can, obviously. So let's talk about color. One thing to keep in mind with speciality malts that we just talked about, so ambers, browns, blacks, chocolates, crystal malts, all these, um, the way they're made, um, certainly at the moment, um, until we get our new piece of uh, equipment working, the tolerance on those is quite wide, um, particularly on the kind of chocolate, black, um, roast barley. It can be as wide as plus or minus 50. So if you have one batch at the bottom of that range, and then the next time you get it is at the top end of the range, it's still in specification, but that difference would certainly affect the color of the final beer. And what we've certainly, what I found out when I was doing some research for, for another brewing company before I joined Chris was that consumers can actually detect a difference of one EBC, even in a darkly lit pub. And so they might take that back and say, look, this is not the beer I usually buy. And that can then cause a complaint. Now, one of the things that would be nice for everyone is to have a little lovey bond comparator. Those are about 700, 800 pounds each. And so if you can't afford that, uh, one of the things that I've suggested to some of my craft customers here in the UK is that they take a photograph of the beer, uh, once it's been fine, once it's clear, uh, at the color that you would like, make that life-sized, so increase the size of it, and then every time you do a batch of that particular beer, take the sample and put it next to the photo and see if you've got consistency. And that at least then gets you into the habit of checking colors before you're dispatching the beer out to customers. Okay, let's move on to the next parameter. Oh, one thing I should mention, um, the units for Institute of Brewing and EBC malts are EBC units, slightly confusing I know, but it is EBC units that we quote for those. And for ASBC malts, uh, the code is, is expressed in degrees lovey bond, which obviously relates to the measurement equipment. And generally it's about half the EBC value. Um, the colors in the US are slightly different and, and lighter than, than ours when they're quoted on the malts. Okay, let's talk about nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is an inherent part of barley. Um, the more nitrogen that is in the barley, the less starch that is there. Um, so depending on what sort of beer you're making and depending on what sort of brew house you have, uh, there will be a range that you'd operate in. So you can see on this particular COA, the nitrogen range for an ale malt would be between 1.4 and 1.6 percent okay so let's move on and talk about that so in the uk in the uk we measure nitrogen and we quote nitrogen um, but to get to protein content which people talk about in the rest of the world um, you multiply by 6.25 uh, so that's a correlation and a factor that can be used um, to bring it back to nitrogen we determine it by the juma Pyrolysis analysis, so that's like basically you burn, you heat the sample and you measure the nitrogen in that way. And what we're really interested in is how well we've broken down the nitrogen content of that barley during the malting process. We need to solubilize some of that. The, the barley grain wants to make that into roots and shoots until such time as it can come out the ground and start photosynthesizing. And so part of that malting process and allowing the seed to grow digest some of the protein and it's important we do that because if we don't as we'll talk about in a minute it can cause some issues in the brewery so we know the nitrogen content of the barley before we started and then we can measure the amount of soluble nitrogen that we've made during the malting process inside the grain once we mash it so again we're doing this on the work and what we get then is a soluble nitrogen ratio and that is expressed in percentage on the EBC analysis. That ratio is reported as callback index for EBC analysis and S over T for ASBC analysis. And normally it'll be about 5% higher 
than the EB than if it had been done on an on an IOB mash because of that proteolytic stand we looked at on the graph. So you do get a little bit more soluble protein derived during that mash step. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind. Okay, so let's talk about how we interpret nitrogen. So the soluble nitrogen ratio, I'll call back in next, the S over T, gives a good indication of how well the endosperm's been modified, how well we've broken it down during that germination process in the maltings. If it's too low, um, what can happen is the malt being under modified can result in poor extract release. There's going to be cell wall material in there that's going to prevent the amylolytic enzymes from breaking down the starch into sugars. And what might also happen is there'll be insufficient yeast nutrients. Um, one of the components of the soluble nitrogen is called free amino nitrogen. And that's absolutely essential in terms of getting yeast to multiply in the first 24 hours of uh, fermentation. And that yeast biomass then carries on to finish the fermentation towards the end uh, of, 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 of the uh, fermentation process. And if there's not enough yeast there, it will result in sluggish or slow fermentations. On the other hand, if we have uh, an SNR, a soluble nitrogen ratio that's too high, then that will result in excessive protein in the wort. Um, there'll be a lot more yeast growth. The yeast will grow very vigorously. But what's likely to happen then is the beer will overshoot its final gravity target and create more alcohol. And also yeast counts in the final beer will be high, so it could be difficult to get the beer clear. So it might block filters, or it might not fine if you're making cask beer. And the other thing that's going to happen if you've over-modified and digested too much of that protein is that you can get hazes that happen in the beer because it's soluble, and also it can impact on foam stability. Um, so if stuff's coming through that is particularly high in modification, then very much keep that in mind uh, and try and counter it, and counter it with other types of malt that have uh, less modified modification, or indeed you can use wheat, which has uh, some good head positive proteins. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about friability. So this is a relatively recent innovation in terms of uh, measurement. And what it's doing through this device here on the right hand side is assessing how crushable the malt is, how easily it is to mill it. So what we do is we take 50 grams of malt, put it inside that little drum, and the arm inside the drum turns around and squeezes the malt against a mesh, and it, we do that for eight minutes. And then what we do, we measure the amount of malt that's gone through the mesh, and that gives us our friability. We can also, also do some measurements on what's left in the drum, and that gives us homogeneity, partly unmodified grains and whole grains. And all these give an indication of cell wall breakdown. So this is important in terms of accessing that starch and making sure that there's not too much cell wall material, because as we'll talk about in a moment, that can cause issues in terms of work viscosity and the speed of runoff. So friability is another indicator of modification of the endosperm. And it's the extent really of beta glucan breakdown. So beta glucans are the cell wall material amongst other things. If we get values much lower than 85%, it might indicate that cell walls haven't been broken down. And that's going to mean that the starch is difficult to access. And extracts will be lower, so you'll get a disappointing yield, and the work will become more viscous. If, at the other hand, it's a high result, it's above 98%, let's say, uh, then what's going to happen is the malts can be quite delicate and fragile. And so as it's moving around the process, be it crushed or indeed if you put it through a mill, then it will have a tendency to shatter and break up. And that will mean a lot of fines, a lot of flour, which ultimately might lead to a stuck match. So we need to be really careful in terms of how we modify them all to make sure that we don't get either of these extremes and make them all that can be easy to use and access the starch and get the yield that you're looking for. As I mentioned, there are some additional measures you can derive from this particular test. And it just really gives us an idea of the consistency of malt modification. So it's the consistency across the batch. 
then that's quite important to make sure that our process is working properly and that all the grains actually did malt and didn't just remain as barley. Um, so that's important that we keep that in mind. Okay, let's talk about enzymes. So there are two analyses that we can do for enzymes, uh, alpha amylase and diastatic power. So these are two uh, starch degrading enzymes. So dextrinizing units are used or are the measure of alpha amylase. And alpha amylase basically breaks down the starch molecules into smaller pieces. Um, so they are quite long chain still, uh, and they're called dextrins. And what that happens to do is basically give the beta amylase enzymes the opportunity to get at the ends of those particular starches uh, of the dextrins and break them down into more simple units. Um, basically, essentially what we want at the end of the day is um, a fermentable wort and the simplest sugars are the ones that the yeast can ferment, particularly maltose as I mentioned there. And uh, those are important in terms of getting to the final gravity that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Albeit you probably want some dextrins there to make sure that you're getting uh, some body and mouthfeel in the beer. Unless, of course, you're doing a root IPA, in which case you're going to ferment it out completely. And that will end up being quite a thin beer. And generally, you need an additional enzyme to do that, uh, which continues to break down all the dextrins into fermentable sugars. Okay, so let's talk about interpreting those numbers. So if the level of amylolytic enzymes in the malt are low, uh, or they're out of balance, the alpha and beta amylase are out of balance, that can cause some problems with yield and with fermentability. So to give you an idea of where we should be sitting, uh, an ale malt would normally have a minimum diastatic power, that's the beta amylase, remember, of 45. And lager and extra pale malts should have a typical minimum DP of around 60. Now, the difference between those essentially is down to the kilning profile. So ale malts are slightly higher in colour, they're slightly lower in moisture, and as a result of that kilning and the heat, we lose some of the enzyme. Um, it's denatured and it's not available to start doing the job it needs to do in the mash tun. Now, with ale malts on UK malts that are well modified, generally you're going to be using those at a very high proportion of, of the, the grist for the brew, and 45 is more than adequate to ensure full conversion and give a good fermentable wort. Uh, lager and extra pale malts, much more gently kilned, uh, so they've got the higher diastatic power. And what can happen, particularly with the lager malts, with the bigger brewers, is they will add 20, maybe even 25% of adjunct in there, uh, such as maize or rice or something like this. And those don't have any enzymes, they're not malted. And so we rely on the enzymes in the 75, 80% of malt that's in there to convert the starch in those cereals as well. So that's why that minimum of 60 is important on lager and extra pale malts. One thing to keep in mind is that the higher the diastatic power, the more fermentable the final work can be. So if you're using an extra pale malt and you want to leave some body in the beer, then mash at a higher temperature than you normally would. So let's say you normally mash at 65 degrees with an ale malt, you're going to make a blonde and you want to still have some body in the beer because it's maybe 3.8% alcohol, then I'd probably mash that in about 68 degrees C and that will then restrict the amount of beta amylase activity and you will get a less fermentable work, which means that you get a nice bit of body in your beer, despite the fact that it's very pale and it's quite low in ABV, you'll still get that nice mouth feel in there. So a little bit about EBC. Um, so EBC analysis expresses it as DPWK, and you can derive that value uh, by using that formula there. Um, the ASPC analysis is expressed as degrees Lindner and is calculated as shown there. So that's pretty similar in actual fact. Okay. Let's talk about beta-glucans. Um, this is the last part of the presentation. So beta-glucans are the major component of endosperm cell walls. So these cell walls hold the, the endosperm together uh, before the 
barley's germinated, they are intact. And what happens is during the germination phase, there are beta-glucanases inside the barley grain that are mobilized and they start to break down these cell walls so they can get to the protein, they can get to the starch and start to create the plant. And that's essentially what they're going to do until such time as the, the, the shoots out of the ground and it can start to photosynthesize and make its own energy. So that's why it's so important that we get these broken down. If there are high levels of beta glucan uh, on the certificate of analysis and towards the top end of the specification range, then that does indicate that there's poor modification that we've not done extensive cell wall breakdown. A lot of the cell wall material is dependent on the growing season. So some years it's higher than others. So the 2018 harvest was quite high and we needed to germinate for a little longer to make sure that we broke down those cell walls. The harvest that we just took in in 2019 is actually lower, uh, quite significantly lower. And so that means that we're not having to worry about that and the malt, the malt will still be nice and friable um, and give us the extract that we're looking for. What we need to do is be aware that the beta-glucans are quite a viscous compound. They do make viscous sticky worts. And one thing that you might be doing now in some of the brews that you do um, is putting oats and rye into those to give more flavor and smoothness and body. And those particular cereals have really high levels of beta-glucan even after malting. And so you should uh, progress and possibly certainly proceed with caution on those because those are going to cause you a slow runoff um, in, at the end of the day. So, um, for example, rye, I think the highest I've known someone do it in a beer and have an acceptable time to run the wort off to kettle is about 16%. All depends on your mashing system, but that is certainly as much as I want to put in a brew um, to avoid any sticky long runoffs and, and any issues. <laughs> 